the 12 voices of Easter, voices of faith and courage, assurance and doubt, hatred and denial, voices revealing the nature of man with a relevance as vital today as it was when spoken 2,000 years ago. Welcome to this special production of the Good News Broadcasting Association. Over the next minutes, you'll hear the dramatic stories of Judas, Peter, Caiaphas, the thief on the cross, Mary Magdalene, Thomas, and others who stood at Calvary watching the Savior die, only to realize that death could not capture the Son of God. These are the stories of those who fully realize the truth of the resurrection and whose messages touch our hearts today. Join us now for this stirring presentation of The Twelve Voices of Easter. I stand at the edge of a cliff, a rope around my neck, the other end tied to a limb on that tree. Dark thoughts fill my mind. I wonder what's come over me. I should have been a leader. I was named Judas after the great patriarch Judah, first among the twelve tribes of Israel. I should have been first among the twelve, not Peter. Now, there's no other way. I've done unspeakable things. I betrayed my master. I am the voice of betrayal. I deserve to die. Yes, that will be the end. At least then, no one will be able to use me ever again. I hate it when people use me. The religious leaders tried to use me. All they wanted was an opportunity to arrest Jesus without creating a riot. I gave them that opportunity. They used me. They paid me off. I thought Jesus wanted to use me too. He wanted to use me to build his kingdom. And he wanted to change me. I could see it in his eyes every time the money box came up short. Jesus knew I was stealing. He knew all about me and he should have hated me. I could fool everyone except him. And I grew to hate him. This tree and this cliff will put an end to all their plans. He wanted me, but only on his terms. And I will not belong to another. I will not be the possession of anyone. I shall be no use to him now. No more errand boy. No more teacher's helper. No one can help him now. They have him. It all came to me at the Passover meal. We gathered in an upper room with Jesus to celebrate the feast. I was overwhelmed with a sudden clarity of purpose, an amazing strength of resolve. I could see it all coming together. It would be easy. I knew what I had been made for. It was all too perfect. The conversation around the table was about the week's festival. One or two had something to say about the interfering Romans. Most of the talk was about the faithfulness of God who redeemed Israel from Egypt long ago. I was silent. Jesus caught my eye a few times, but I looked away. Then, Jesus interrupted the conversation by announcing that one of us would soon betray him. The room was instantly still. The faces around the table all showed stunned amazement. Of course, everyone had heard talk that the leaders of the council would pay for information leading to Jesus' arrest, but none of them imagined that anyone would ever betray the master. One by one, each disciple asked if he were the one. I asked too, of course. Low voices ringed at the table in worried discussion. The meal progressed. As I dipped my hand in the dish, Jesus said something to the two next to him, Peter and John. They looked at me, wariness on their faces, and I knew he had told them. I don't know how he knew, but I had already been to the chief priests and offered to betray Jesus. Somehow, he must have known about it. Well, I had to get out of there. I stood and rushed out of the room. It was time. I expected them to go to the garden in Gethsemane after dinner. Whenever we visited Jerusalem, that was his favorite place. He loved the solitude for prayer. I went straight to the chief priests and told them to hurry. If the other disciples guessed my plans, they might spoil everything. We must act now, I said. They agreed. Some went to get the temple police. The rest of us went to the Roman garrison where the priests requested a contingent of soldiers to accompany us. I led the way. 
It was exhilarating. I was in command. No one using me. Everyone following me. I had the power. When we got to the garden, as I expected, Jesus was praying. The others had fallen asleep. Jesus heard his coming and roused the disciples. I stepped forward from the shadows. It was dark and the torches did not provide much light. I had arranged a signal to identify Jesus in the darkness. I kissed him on the cheek and greeted him, Rabbi. I had greeted him that way a hundred times, we all had. With a simple daily habit, an innocent token of greeting, I betrayed the master. He always wanted to be the master, to be served. For all his talk about serving others, he was always the master, as though he had been born king or something. Well, now that they have him, what kind of kingdom do you think he'll inherit? It's one thing to lead a few disciples and country peasants when the sun shines on the hillside, but see if anyone follows him when night has come and all is darkness. Nobody can rule from a cross. Well, I will not serve. I am no one's tool. Finally, in this act, I am free, not being used by anyone. Free, a rope around my neck, standing at the edge of this cliff. Soon, I'll be free. And yet, I wonder, can a man's death solve anything? I mean, if a man gives himself to death freely, no one taking it from him, can one who gives himself to death accomplish anything? Can a dead man hanging on a tree serve any purpose? I'm going to find out. I am just one step from freedom. <laughs>